Now, mach machines are good at reading. They can read much faster than we can. And they're also good at logic. Logic is, by definition, mechanical steps. And machines are good at that. So we should be having machines help us read code. And that's been the focus of this work. And also write code, too. Uh, machines are, uh, are, are less likely to make trivial mistakes. And when we're doing refactoring of big programs, um, we often make mistakes. So we should be having machines help us with that, too. So the, the talk is structured in three parts. The first is uh, some code comprehension tools that I've been building. The first is Oracle. The second, Godoc, or rather some new features of Godoc. Um, the second part, the middle of the, the talk, will be how these things actually work. So I'm going to go into some uh, of the libraries and also algorithms of how they work. And then finally, I'll talk about two refactoring tools. The first is called GoRename, and the second, EG, for example. So um, there's a lot of demos here, so um, uh, I'm going to switch tabs. Um, the first demo is of a tool called the Oracle. So the Oracle is a, is a code comprehension tool that is integrated into your editor. Right now, there are bindings for um, Emacs, or uh, community-contributed bindings for Vim, and I think for Sublime. Um, so I'm going to use Emacs here, but it doesn't really matter which editor you're in. You just need a few lines to connect the two together. Um, so the first thing we can do with, um, with Oracle is just to uh, position ourselves on some, some piece of code and then ask it a question. So I'm typing a tiny little, I don't know if you can read the font down here, but I'm asking, um, go Oracle, uh, describe here. And it says, um, it says this thing here, so let me see if I can make the font bigger. Can you read that? It said that is, let's see if we can get it to go at the bottom as well. Every projector does something different, I notice. Um, this is a, a definition of a method. And if we click on that little link there, let's make it bigger again. If we click on that link, it takes us to the, the, uh, the definition. So let's try another one. We type branch. If we, if we query this word here, it says, no, this is painful. It says this is a, a reference to a type called branch. It tells you its size, which might be useful if you're into uh, space optimization. It tells you the underlying type, and it also tells you the method set. Now, as you know, method sets are not uh, always obvious from a declaration of a type because methods can come from uh, embedded fields. So this actually does that computation for you. Um, let's try a more sophisticated query. What about um, the type uh, tree here? Let's ask uh, what types implement this. And this time it says, I'm sorry, sorry, this is frustrating. Um, it says this interface type tree is implemented by a pointer type star tree branch and by the basic type tree leaf. Um, and you can ask the query starting from a concrete type or from an interface type. Um, there's another query you can do where we say, um, what does this variable here tree point to? So this is actually a, is actually a pointer of some kind. It's, a, it's an interface containing a pointer. Um, so I'm asking a query, what does, this, what does this thing point to? It has to think a little bit harder this time. And it says, it may contain, this interface may contain the dynamic type leaf. Um, if we point to this other, um, this other variable down here and ask, what does this one point to? It says, well, this one actually points to um, only a, a type branch. And branch is a pointer, which itself may point to an object allocated um, at this line here. Um, so you can actually analyze the, the structure of your program and understand where pointers point to. And you notice that this, this tree variable at different points during its uh, life in this function actually points to different kinds of things. Um, we can say um, these calls to tree.sum here, these are interface calls. We can say, what are the callees of this, of this, uh, this function call? And this time it says, um, this is a dynamic method call that dispatches to the sum method of the leaf type up here. If we ask for the second call down at the bottom, can you see my, my cursor, by the way? Are you able to follow? Oh, OK, so I'll, let me select it so you can see this. This time we're, we're selecting the, um, the, the sum uh, call down here. I'm going to say, what are the, the, the possible calls of this thing? And it says that it can dispatch to um, two, th two types this time. It can dispatch to. Um, the leaf method, uh, so the, the leaf sum method, or to the uh, branches sum method, because this one's actually a, an interface call with two possible concrete types. So the analysis is able to understand these kinds of things. Otherwise, you'd have to read the structure of the code uh, more carefully. So it's not just looking at the types, in other words. Um, I'm, I'm sorry the, the screen layout's a little bit uh, strange today. So I'm going to do one other uh, query here. If we start inside the um, string method and say, if we, where is this function called from? So I'm going to ask the, the call errors query this time. And it says um, that this leaf string method is called from one place, and it's here. It is inside the printf library. So it's actually understood that, that the, there's a dynamic call from in printf back up to the string method, um, which is, in fact, the only place in this program that this method is called from. If we ask um, on the other um, string method who are the callers of this function here, it does a different query, and it says it's the same thing. Um, Finally, I'm just going to show you um, 
Uh, actually, that's, a, that's about enough of the oracle. So it, it's, a, it's a tool that can, can answer uh, the kinds of questions that you probably have many times a day when you're analyzing a piece of code, especially unfamiliar code that perhaps someone on your team wrote or that or you've just been asked to, to fix a bug in. So returning to the slides again, um, the, second, uh, the second demonstration is of the Godoc tool. So Godoc is uh, Go's uh, cross-reference documentation browser. It has two uh, views, the package view, which shows you the logical API and the exported functions of a package. And the uh, source code view just shows you the, the source code files making up the package. Um, so this tool uh, has been around for many years. Um, recently, we've added these, this flag to it, which is the dash analysis flag. And if you run the tool with this, um, this flag and it takes two possible uh, values, it does some static analysis. So the first um, uh, the, sort of the, the lowest level, if you like, is just type analysis, and then the, the more expensive analysis is called pointer analysis. So I'll show you the effects of both of these analyses right now. So here we are in a typical uh, 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 package of, uh, view of Godoc. We're in the net HTTP package. Um, we're looking at the type file, which is an interface, and as you can see, it's an interface that is um, defined partly by embedding other interfaces, so you accumulate the methods uh, uh, that you get from those ones plus the ones that you've declared uh, below. And th there are new, two new little widgets here that don't appear in the usual um, uh, invocation of Godoc. So the first is the implements um, uh, tab. So this tells you, for this interface, what, are the, what is the set of concrete types that, that satisfy the, the methods of this, uh, this interface? And also, which other interfaces um, also satisfy uh, this, uh, this type? Um, so these are things that you would otherwise have to look pretty hard through your code base to see this, because Go doesn't have any explicit relationship in the source code between a concrete type and, and an interface. So you might have to look fairly hard to, to find them. Um, and it also shows you the complete method set. So here you can see that it has the three that we declared, plus all the ones we got from io.closer and io.reader. Um, so we'll now go, now go to the... Um, uh, sorry, let's go to the source code view. So now we're in the source code view for the I.O. package, and this is a whole lot of interfaces. Um, and we can get the same kind of information here. So if we click on uh, read closer, for example. Um, so by the way, the, the, the blue links on this page are new. This is because we enabled the, the type analysis uh, mode of, of Godoc. So clicking on um, a, t a declaration of a type tells you the same information. It tells you the set of uh, uh, concrete types that implement this thing, and also the set of uh, methods it has. And obviously clicking on a a name will jump you to the uh, definition of that name, as you'd expect. Um, so uh, let's pick a, another concrete type. So in this package, we're in the um, sorry, we're in the um, uh, IO util package now, and there's a little type here called not closer. And if we click on that one, it tells us that it's a, a structure of size 16, which is the size of one interface value. Um, it tells us three interfaces that it implements and the methods it has. Uh, if we just hover over a random identifier, so this one's reader, it tells us, I'm sorry, again, the font's very small, but it's telling us this is a function, it's a method of the file type, it tells us all the parameters and the result types. So this can save us a trip to the documentation when we're just trying to read a, a, a passage of code. Um, so this works for any identifier. It tells us what kind it is, what type it is, and it'll jump us to the definition. Um, let's go now to... Um, so here we are inside the uh, strings test uh, a, a, a test file inside the strings package of the standard library. And what you'll notice is that there's a lot of functions here, and each of them, the func keyword is highlighted. And this func keyword is, is a link that takes you to, from this function to the functions that could potentially call it. Um, so there's a function here called rot13. I, I don't know if you remember, in the old days of email, if you wanted to keep something secret, you would, you would rotate the characters around the alphabet so that it would, um, you, you wouldn't be able to read it very easily, but you could easily undo it. Um, and so this function is just uh, uh, used in the test because we're trying to test the, the map function. So the map function takes a string and applies a, a, a rune or character transformer to every character of the string and then returns the string you get from applying that transformation. So rot13 is going to be one of these character transformers. You can see it has the type uh, takes a rune, returns a rune, and the test map function below is going to, uh, to call it. So let's click now on the func uh, uh, keyword and it jumps us to the, um, the, the caller. There's only one caller, so it takes us straight there. And here we are, oops, here we are straight inside the, right inside the strings.map function. And this is a dynamic call. So you notice that it's a, uh, a call that has, the, the, the tooltip's too small to read, but it's 26 potential dynamic callers at this point, because this variable mapping here 
is um, the function, the, the, the parameter mapping passed into the function. So in other words, this analysis can understand the dynamic calling structure of your program. Um, if we go jump through this call, it says there are a whole lot of places it might go to. And a lot of these are actually anonymous functions defined inside the test. Um, there's our rot13 function. Um, you can see this one here is uh, another anonymous function. So when you're looking at a piece of code like this and you see an anonymous function, you might um, before have had to do some detective work to figure out where it gets called from, but now you can just click on a single uh, token. Um, the same information um, about the calling structure is shown in a different way in the package view here. So this is the JSON package for JSON encoding, um, and it has a function called Marshall indent, and there's a new little widget called internal call graph, which will actually take you sort of through the internal structure of this function um, to show you how it fits together. So internally it calls indent and it calls Marshall, Marshall itself is made up of these, these components, and you can see that um, you can sort of expand the tree arbitrarily far down to get a feel for how the, the, the parts fit together. Array encode, you can see, is actually a recursive function, so it calls itself, and this tree will just keep on expanding as deep as you care to, care to go. Um, and then finally, um, we go to see this package um, here. Um, actually, there's two more. So, so who of you have written a test um, with an, using example functions? Has anyone seen this feature go? Yeah, one, okay, two. So uh, when you write test in Go, you use the, uh, the prefix test on your function and the test tool knows that it's special and, and runs it and makes sure it uh, uh, doesn't fail. Um, if you instead write a function whose name begins with the word example, um, it, it actually uh, runs, the, runs the code and makes sure that it prints the, the same uh, thing to stood out that appears in a comment uh, inside that, that file. And the purpose of these kinds of tests is to demonstrate um, how your API is to be used. So these actually appear in the documentation, but there are executable documentation that actually tests as well. So it's a very good way to make sure your examples don't get stale as they would if they were just living inside comments. Um, so here, this piece of code here is actually inside the testing package, and it's the piece of code in the testing tool that, that makes that dynamic call. Um, so what it does is it, uh, at, at build time, it actually scans your program for these functions and then builds a table of these things. Each one of these has three parts, a name, which is the name of your example function. It has um, an output string, which is what is expected that this, function, this, this example will print on stood out. And it has f, which is the actual code of your example function. And then this, this code here finally just does for each of these entries in the table, uh, it, ju it just calls that function. And so this dynamic call here, the tooltip says 196 callees, you're saying this is a, a polymorphic call. It's a call that goes to many possible places, which is all of the example functions. And if we click on it, you'll notice that um, all of the functions that it says this might jump to, this dynamic call, all the names begin with example. But if we hover over the type of f, it tells us that this is a function that takes no arguments and returns no arguments. Now, those functions are a dime a dozen. They're all over your program. There's probably hundreds or thousands in a, in a typical program. Um, yet, the analysis is able to follow the flow of these things from that table through this function and down to this dynamic call, and it knows that only the ones called example can possibly reach this point in the program. So it's a very precise uh, kind of analysis. Another thing we can do with this, this kind of precision of the uh, understanding of the pointer structure of your program is to understand the aliasing of channel operations. So often when you're reading a Go program, uh, you, you get a value, you send it on a channel, and then you want to know where does it sort of pop out the other end. I want to go, go through the code from here to there. But the channel might have a different name over there. It might um, be in a variable. Um, it might be in another package. You just, it's often very hard to tell. But, but so, so navigating through unfamiliar code can be, can be a challenge. But if we know uh, that two uh, channel variables point to the same um, um, make channel operation, we know that those two could actually send values between, uh, uh, to each other. So here, we're inside the um, HTTP, uh, the transport file of the HTTP package. And there's a channel here. Uh, called waiting dialer. I don't know what this code does, but it's, but it's a suitable example. Um, it's a channel that uh, we're going to send PCON on it. And now if we just click this channel send operator, it tells us three things. It says this channel is made by a function called get idle conjure. It's, it's sent at this place uh, by put idle con, and it's received in a third place called get con. These are all different functions. Um, and notice that the name of the channel here is, um, is a different local variable. So you wouldn't have, you wouldn't have guessed that these uh, these things were related just by looking at the names in the program. So it can give us very precise uh, answers to queries about the structure. Um, so I'm going to go back to the slides now. Um, there it is. So part two, how, how does this stuff work? 
So this diagram here shows the, the sort of stack of, uh, of libraries and tools that we've been building. Um, this all lives in the uh, golang.org uh, X tools repo. Um, the, the bottom part is the, the parser, which is really four components, a, a scanner a, a, and a parser and the relevant data structures. And this actually lives in the standard library. Um, so on top of the parser, we have um, the, by the way, the blue boxes are uh, libraries and the yellow boxes are tools. So the, the, the GoFumps tool, which you're probably all familiar with, I hope you're all familiar with it because it's, it's great. Um, this doesn't actually need very much of this sort of technology, so it, it just needs a, a parse tree, and that's why it's lower down in the stack. On top of the parser is the, uh, the type checker, um, and uh, on top of the type checker, we have three tools, vet, vet, eg, and go rename. So vet is a simple static analysis tool that looks for patterns in your code that are often a sign of a bug. EG, I'll show you later, is an example-based refactoring tool, and Go Rename is, a, um, is an editor-integrated uh, renaming tool. On top of the um, type checker, there's another uh, library called the SSA, uh, uh, Go SSA package. Uh, and on top of that, we have um, uh, the pointer analysis, which is the, the, the machinery that was responsible for those channel alias and also dynamic calling uh, kinds of queries. And uh, there's the Oracle and GoDoc. Um, and context plumbing I'm not going to talk about today. LL Go is an is a, is a adapter from the SSA form, which is, which is really a compiler's representation of a Go program. Uh, and LL Go adapts that to the LLVM compiler so that we can actually compile Go programs through the LLVM tool chain. And it's used for another tool at Google that I won't talk about today. Um, so I'll go through those packages bottom up in some more detail. The, the type checker um, actually does three jobs. Only one of them is type checking. The other two are to discover um, what we call resolution. In other words, what um, Every identifier in the program, what, what does it resolve to? What does it refer to? Which declaration uh, is it a reference to? Um, the second is, uh, is to, for every constant expression in the program, is to compute the value uh, of that expression. And the third, of course, is to infer for every expression and declaration its type. And these look like they're all independent things, but in fact, you can't do any one without the other two. They're actually uh, subtly uh, interconnected in, in, in ways that we didn't expect when we began, I think. Um, there are some parts of this are extremely complicated. It turns out that computing the method set of a given expression is, is, has been an enormous time sink. We've spent weeks and weeks and weeks on this one algorithm that's no more than the two pages of code. Um, and along the way, we've found so many bugs in all the other compilers, GC and um, uh, 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 GCC Go, and, and things where the spec was unclear that we fed a whole stream of bug fixes back into those tools and the spec. Um, so it's been a substantial project. And most of this work, by the way, was done by Robert Griesemer, one of the, the, the authors of Go. And I've just been his primary uh, uh, bug reporter, because every time I found uh, bugs, I would um, submit them to him. So the next uh, level up was the SSA uh, representation. So the, the reason we have this is because the syntax trees uh, that, are, that you get from the parser are actually, uh, they have too much information that's latent, latent within them. Um, so, for example, when you see a, a, an expression A sub I with square brackets, it could be a map uh, lookup, it could be a string index, it could be a, a pointer to a struct, sorry, a pointer to an array or a slice, and, and this, they're all quite different things. So they shouldn't, you shouldn't have to uh, guess by looking at the, the syntax tree. So we lower the, the, the representation down to this, this compiler-like intermediate representation called static single assignment, um, and it's a nice format because um, it, it actually builds in some of the kind of work of data flow analysis so that you get more precise results at very little effort. Um, it's, it was kind of cool in the 90s, but now everyone uses it. Um, and um, it turns out you can express basically all of every Go program using only about 30 basic instructions. So it's a nice format for doing further work because you only need to define 30 cases in a type switch, uh, and then that, that's your analysis. Um, and we've tried very hard to keep this faithful to, to the Go spec. So it has all the same data types as Go, interfaces, channels, maps, and so on. Um, and uh, it also maps for every register and expression in this format. Um, uh, the, the corresponding source level expression. So you can have tools that go back and forth between those two very easily. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, it's actually the basis for the LLVM uh, front end. It, it's a very similar format to LLVM's own internal uh, representation. So I'm going to give you a demo of a little tool called SSA Dump that's an extremely uh, geeky tool, but it, it may give, give you a feel for what's going on in this, this representation. We have uh, the Hello World program here, um, and I'm just going to show you... Um, if you run, run this little tool, FSA dump, um, this, is, this is a dump of the, uh, the internals. So you can see that one little print statement actually was doing a set of things. It was, it was allocating an array for the var args, uh, the, the, the variadic uh, argument list. It was taking the address of that thing and, and converting the string into an interface, 
storing it into the array and making a slice of the array and then calling print. So those are the, all the underlying operations. Uh, so th that call to print actually had a whole lot of hidden stuff going on. Um, so here's a little Fibonacci function. Um, and if we run this, <coughs> this tool again, um, you'll see it produces, uh, sorry, is that right? Yes, okay, so here's the Fibonacci function here. I don't want to bore you with the details here, but I just wanted to show you that if you ask for debug information, you can see there's all these extra comments that map things like um, a particular um, selector expression, that's like font.println, um, to um, a particular register in, the, in, in this uh, representation. So there's a lot of detail in that if you want to start playing with these tools for your own, for your own things. Um, and finally, it also has a, um, uh, an interpreter in it, which I actually built just in order to test that this, this SSA construction uh, worked right. So there's an interpreter that just looks at these little instructions and interprets them. And you can run small programs like, for example, the test of the Unicode package. So that's entirely inside the interpreter right there. That's why it's so slow. Um, so back to the slides. So um, the pointer analysis package, which was in that diagram, one level higher than SSA, um, I'm going to talk about that now. So pointers complicate uh, reasoning about programs because functions can be called dynamically. A variable can be um, updated uh, and, and accessed via different names. You can, you, can, you can have all kinds of different expressions that talk about the same piece of memory. Um, and also there are things in Go that are, um, that are, that are, that are, that are like uh, interfaces which, which contain dynamic type values. And so you can pass types around in effect and then, and then dynamic function calls can, uh, you, have to, you have to do more analysis to know where they were dispatched to. So a pointer analysis is, a, is an analysis that answers the question, uh, what, what variables might this particular expression point to? So what we do is we take the, the, the program in that SSA form, and we say for every uh, expression that's, that's a pointer, and, and when I say pointer, I also mean things like maps, channels, funks, interfaces, we, we, uh, we, we give it a, a variable called the points to set of P, PTS of P. Um, and this, th this set can point to things like um, global variables or uh, maps that we created in a make, uh, uh, make map operation um, or local variables. And so we're trying to figure out which, what things are in that set. And so we look at every single statement in the, in the whole program in this SSA form, and we generate uh, constraints. So this, the constraints are here. I'm only going to describe a few of them. Um, but if we see an assignment from X to Y, then we know that the set of things that Y points to must be a superset of the set of things that X points to. So that was easy. If we see this, this operation here, we know that Y must point to at least X. So X is in that set. And then there are more complicated rules for uh, uh, stores and loads because um, uh, because now you have to say that all the things that, um, for example, in this case here, we're looking at a store operation. Um, we need to say that the set of things that, um, for every single thing that Y could point to, um, the points to set of, that, of, of those things must include at least X. And, this, and you see these, these things get quite, uh, quite complicated. And there are even more constraints for um, reflection and dynamic type assertions and so on. But the idea is that we, 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 we've given a, an abstract variable PTS of P to every point of value in the program, we build this big set of constraints, and then we have to solve the constraint system. Um, so fortunately, every single Go operation can be expressed in this fairly small set of constraints, even maps and channels and functions and so on. They all can be just expressed as struct structure operations underneath. Um, we don't bother trying to do sound things with unsafe pointer uh, conversions. A compiler would have to do that, but we don't care about soundness because uh, we're not generating code here. Um, there's a lot of technical detail here. I think I'm probably not having time to go into these, so I'm just going to skip through. Um, and um, explain that, that typically you're looking at a system here which uh, has about 250,000 variables and, and 200,000 equations for a program of, of the size of the kinds of tools I work on, for example. So a 120,000 line tool would generate a, a system this big. And what you're trying to do is once you've created these, these nodes, uh, these, these, these points to expressions and these edges that connect them, the constraints, you're trying to essentially compute the transitive closure, just sort of flow these values through the graph and see what they reach. And transitive closure is a problem that takes uh, cubic time and results in a, in a result that's quadratic space. So it's a very expensive algorithm. Um, but the nice thing is that because it's a cubic time algorithm, the, the more that we re reduce that, 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 that x in the, in the cubic term, that we get a cubic benefit back. So um, we can bring this using optimizations down to about a quarter of the size of the number of variables and equations. And I'll explain very quickly what those optimizations are. So if you have a sequence of variables p, q, r, and s, each of which is assigned one to another, you know that, that because nothing else gets to any one of those nodes, that the solution for all of them is going to be the same. So you can sort of crush that chain down into one single node. In the second 
case here, you have three variables where the values flow around them in a circle. And so you know that, that whatever reaches one is also eventually going to reach the others as well. So you can, you can kind of crush these circles down into a single node that represents all three of them. And in the third one, you have um, two pointers that both happen to point to the same pair of uh, things. So you can just say, well, let's just treat them as, one, uh, as one, one node that represents both of them together. So you're trying to kind of exploit these symmetries in the constraint graph to reduce the number of nodes so that cubic term gives you a, a nice benefit. Um, it's transitive closure. We do a lot of other optimizations I won't have time to talk about. Um, but because you're storing these sets, and there's lots of these sets, and they have lots of things in them, it really pays to use a, a good representation for, for uh, inter sets of integers. So we have this thing called a, a sparse bit vector. There's a link here. You can look at the code. It's, it's kind of fun. Um, and then you run the solver. And it takes um, uh, a few hundred milliseconds, produces, with logging enabled, it runs much slower and produces gigabytes of output, which uh, can be quite painful to, uh, to step through. But it, it's fixed now. So. Um, that's the machinery behind the, the Godoc and Oracle tools. Um, once you've computed the solution, you can now uh, read the, the, the call information directly. So you know that every dynamic call, you just need to see what are the point, the concrete types that this, that this thing could point to. And those, are the, those tell me the methods where this call could, could, could dispatch to. Um, I'm going to skip on again because I think we're out of time. So refactoring tools. Uh, finally, I'd like to talk about um, two of these. The first is Go Rename. So uh, this is a tool that does precise and type-safe identifier renaming. So we've all done renamings where we use said to just, every time you see this string, replace it with that string. And that's great if you have a unique uh, a name, like a, a long method name, for example. But if you have a field name called offset and you just want to change it to index, then uh, that's not going to work because there's hundreds of things called offset. And it's even worse for single, single letter names. So what we want is a tool that uses that resolution information that the type checker gave us, the, the, the knowledge of which identifiers refer to which declarations and to just rename the, the, the pairs that correspond to each other, but not anything else. So this tool can be used both from the command line, and there's an example uh, command here, although I think very few people use it in this way. Um, and it can also be used by many editors. And people who work on Vim, Sublime, and Acme have contributed uh, bindings for these. I, I wrote the Emacs one, because that's, that's what I use. Um, all the renamings that it does are reversible. So you can, if you make a mistake, you can just go back. That's a nice property I didn't anticipate. Um, and it's sound, which means that either um, it will succeed and the program will still compile with the same meaning, or it'll give you an error that says why it can't make the change. So this is a much better than what you get from said, which just quietly destroys your program. Um, and the caveat here is that because it's a static analysis tool, it can't understand reflection. Um, and just there are, if, you, if you're using reflection-heavy programs, it, it could break. Still, better than said. Um, so one quick demo here. Um, if we go to Emacs, and um, where, oh, it's, it's this Emacs. Here we go. So uh, we can do a renaming of this type. This is a tree, a tree uh, uh, structure here, binary tree. So there's two t concrete types: the branch and the leaf. And I'm going to rename the leaf to tip. Um, so go rename leaf becomes tip. Bam. Okay, so it changed all three of those. That you could have done with said. Let's change LHS. We decide we, we don't like LHS. We, we want to call this left. So we're going to rename LHS becomes left. And those all changed. And let's change RHS to uh, right as well. This time, we get an error. So what happened here is, um, let's make that bigger. It said, renaming this field right-hand side to right, and it takes us to the place, would make this reference here, x.right, ambiguous with this field. So there's actually a pretty complicated piece of, of Go code here. Um, sorry. So what it's saying is that um, this type, uh, the, the anonymous type that, ha that is used for the variable x, has all the things in answer and all the things in branch. And if we change branch so that one of its fields now becomes right and not RHS, then this x actually has two things called, called right in it. It has the one that you get from answer and the one that you get via branch. Now that in itself is not an error, but because we have a reference down here, that refers to it, it's got to be unambiguous. And in this case, it's not. If we took that line out, it would, it would actually be fine. So in other words, it can see these things that you would never spot if you were just doing said-based renaming or just having a, a, doing some guesswork. Um, and let's try another couple of things. There's a new, a new feature I'm going to show you right now. If you um, change um, branch.sum, we change that method to, um, let's call it add them um, up. So this time it says there's an error here because renaming uh, this method from sum to add them up 
would make tree.branch no longer assignable to interface tree. So this, obviously this method is required to have the same name as the one in the interface, so that's not a sound renaming. And then it gives you a hint. It says, rename tree.tree.sum, i.e. the abstract method, if you So let's do that now. So we go to tree.sum, and we say, um, go rename this to add them up. And now you'll notice that it changed the interface method and all the concrete methods and all the calls and everything else too. Now I must warn you that this particular one cannot be done soundly in all cases. So it's possible that there are programs that will break because of that change, but all the other ones are sound. So that's the end of the Go Rename demo. Um, and then finally, uh, the last tool is uh, EG. So this is an example-based refactoring tool. So I, I shamelessly ripped this off of uh, Louis Wasserman at Google's uh, ReFaster tool written in Java. Um, you basically take a, a little template like this where you say, I want the code that looks before like this to be replaced with this code in the after uh, function. And so in this case, we're changing calls where you use the error formatting mechanism, but you in fact just print a string to just create an error with that, uh, with that string directly. Now, I don't recommend you actually make this change. And in fact, there are cases where it's not safe. But let's say you did want to make this change. Um, you just run the eg tool with this t parameter saying what template file. So this, this file here would be the template. Um, and then you tell it which packages you want to modify. So um, if we go back to our shell and we look at um, the template, this is the same template you saw more or less. There's, it's not using the errors, it's just using font print. And the input to this will be uh, eg test test.go. So in this case, there are two calls to font printf. And now let's run the tool. So eg test so eg uh, dash t template and then uh, EG test, test .go. So we'll notice it prints the results of standard output unless you tell it to actually overwrite the files. Notice that it changed the first one, as it should have, but it didn't change the second one because this isn't actually a call to fun.printf, even though it looks like one. This is actually a call to the uh, logger, to the printf method of the logger, and we've chosen this really perverse variable named fun here just to try to confuse it, but it, it wasn't fooled. Um, so it didn't, it didn't screw the code up, which you would have done if you'd used uh, a said or something like that, or, or go fun dash r, which can do simple kinds of renamings. So it's type safe. So back to the slides. And um, so I, I'll finish up now. I just want to say that, that Go has sort of been known from the beginning for the quality of its tools. It has this Go tool, which is a Swiss army knife with many simple, well thought out things. And, and GoFumpt has been a real uh, a sort of high, a bar for us to a high bar for us to follow because it's a tool that people at first they're a little bit um, afraid of it because they don't want somebody else m messing up their hard written source code and then they get used to it and then one day they're using somebody else's editor and they're like well, wh wh how do you, how do you live like this I can't imagine working without these tools anymore so so that's really the the, the model for the, these other tools to, to to follow so we've been building over the last year or two these these tools of increasing sophistication, and we're, we're just starting to, to, to make more uh, applications uh, based on them. And so one question I want to leave you with is, is what should we build next? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Um, in terms of six dependencies, do you have any suggestions on tools that would help uh, find them? Or six, six dependencies six between packages or between, between declarations? Um, either or. So for the packages, you, you can't have six dependencies. Yes. But for uh, a very good question. The question was um, the recording, uh, uh, how do we uh, deal with cyclic dependencies? Um, so right now, there's a, there are two projects going on at the moment to get rid of all C in the, uh, in the Go distributions. There are two main places where a lot of C code exists. One is the runtime, and the other is the compiler. And as of now, I think the runtime is free of C code. It's just a pure Go program. But because it was from a C program, and it can't be translated, or, or at least translated uh, in C style, um, it's actually a huge package with 1,300 package-level declarations. And now that, we, now that it's a Go program, we should just be able to split this up into lots and lots of sub-packages. And so the last two weeks, I've been working on a tool to, um, to, to do this. So you, you, you build a dependency graph of declarations, and then you try to kind of pull off the low-hanging fruit into, into clumps that, are, that are, uh, form a DAG, and then to actually rename these, these clumps into separate packages so that they... Um, so, so this tool is, is a hat right now for the runtime package, but I know that we're going to have to do the exact same thing again with the compiler, and, um, and then, of course, we'll have a tool that I think should be usable for uh, general purpose uh, work. What are you going to call it? Um, it's called Sock Drawer right now, because it's <laughs> for uh, tidying up your messes, um, organizing your, your stuff. Question? Yeah, were all the tools shown here uh, like available now, or some of them still in development? Well, it's all in the open source tree right now. You, you, uh, these are all built from head. How easy was it for you to start using Oracle in your regular flow? 
see that there's a couple of different subcommands, and now you just so, your question is, do I use the Oracle in my own flow? And the answer is, um, I, do, I do, when I'm developing tools, use it quite a bit, yeah. Um, I, one of the main problems I have is that is I tend to work in about 10 different workspaces because I'm making one change here and another one here. And, and to remember to switch it is the kind of the problem I haven't really solved yet. So sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm stale. But, um, but I, I, do, I do use it. I think people who work in one tree in particular, it's, it's, it's very easy to set up. Uh, you mentioned uh, something about the uh, uh, solver built in the Oracle tool. So which built-in? Uh, a solver. Uh, a constraint solver, yeah. A uh, constraint solver. Yeah. How is that implemented? Like important in library or is like? No, this is all written from whole cloth. So this is the, the Go pointer package in that uh, original uh, stack diagram. It's, okay. it's one of the modules there. So you can go see the source. Uh, okay. But it's 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 Anderson's pointer analysis is the kind of category of thing that it is. Question. The tools that you talked about seem like very um, CPU intensive. Can you talk about like how much time you put into trying to reduce that or counteract that? Yeah. So um, the, the question is, are, are these tools very CPU intensive? And the answer is, uh, uh, yes, they, they they can be. So for example, if the Godoc instance I was running here, um, it is I ran it before I, get, I got here, and it took about um, a minute or so, I think, I forget exactly, it took about a minute to run on a code base that's about 350,000 lines of code. And um, I've run it on a program a code base of about a million. So after that, it starts to use quite a, a bit of memory. Um, in future, I may break it up into smaller pieces that can be run independently and then the results combined, especially if you have a, a cluster, there may be ways to do this, but it's, it's, it's not, I haven't started this at all right now. Um, the, the Oracle tool um, does the same analysis, but does it totally on the fly. So th this one here is, is doing for the whole, <coughs> the whole of your Go path, every single program and test in your, in your, in your tree. The Oracle was doing just for the one you, you had, I had told before um, to look at. So I told it to look at that little tree program. Normally I tell it to look at the set of a dozen tools that I work on. Um, and if I, if I was to run it on, 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 on those tools, which is about um, 180,000 lines of code, it would probably take about a second or two for some of the point analysis queries. Um, the type queries are much faster. So it's quite usable for interactive work. Um, but for an enormous code base, doing this kind of uh, Godox style thing, you, you typically run it and then wait for it. Question. You mentioned one slide there was one law that was on the order of about one gigabyte. Yeah. Is that the Oracle? That's the, the, that was the point analysis internal debug logs, which nobody but me can understand. And um, they only use them when I'm tra tracking down a bug. Um, if I was to run with that normally, it would, that would dominate the runtime by, by a huge factor. Right. So now, what was the size of the code base that was run off, and how long did it generate that log? So, um, so, so if I were to run the Oracle tool on itself, it would give me an answer within um, uh, about a, a second or two for typical queries. Um, and it would be, uh, there's an input that's 180,000 lines of code, mm -hmm. um, a constraint system of about 250,000 lines, optimized down to 80,000 lines, uh, sorry, nodes. Um, and then the, the whole thing runs in, in just a few seconds. So it's, it, it's, it's usable for interact. It's, it's usable for interactive uh, uh, work for, for, for single programs of moderate size. Um, but if, you, if you're running on, a, on, a, on your entire company's code base, you wouldn't want to use the Oracle tool each time. You just want to pick the tool that you're working on at that moment. So I, I, I didn't indicate that I pre-configured Emacs with a variable, which is which, which program are we, are we working in right now? And so you can give it a half a dozen if you want, but you have to tell it something. Any other questions? No, well, thank you very much for having me. Oh, sorry. I really didn't know that change actually happened. Um, when did this yeah, feature get added? Yeah, yeah. So it's not, if you go to GoLand at all, you won't see this right there. And the um, reason is because App Engine has a one gigabyte absolute limit on memory usage, and we just can't run it in that space um, because of the search index as well. So it's not there, but I'm hoping to get it, uh, that feature switched on in the next, uh, the next few months. But it's nothing at all to do with the analysis, it's just to do with the memory. Um, <laughs> but the feature has been there since um, the summer, sometime, a few months. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe almost a year, I don't know. It's been a while. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much.